Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for joining us online as well. I want to start our time of worship together. I want to start by reading from Psalm 25, beginning in verse 12. Who is the person who fears the Lord? He will show him the way he should choose. He will live a good life, and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret counsel of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he reveals his covenant to them. My eyes are always on the Lord, for he will pull my feet out of the net. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a time to gather and and worship and hear your word and encourage one another. Lord, as we gather today, we pray your spirit speak to our hearts and to our minds. Help us to minister to one another, serve one another, and bring glory to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Good morning and welcome to Living Hope. My name is Jeannie Greenman and I work with the Skate Riot Ministry as well as host the 1015 online service. These are ways that you can get involved in our church. Christmas Eve is coming. On December 24th, we will only have one service in the morning. It will be at 1015 a.m. Then bring your friends and family back to celebrate the birth of our Savior at our 6 p.m. candlelight service. It's the season of giving. Have you given your giving blanket yet? You can pick up a giving blanket in our online shop today. Just as the name suggests, the goal is to give the blanket away to someone in need. All proceeds of the purchase go towards repairing the church floors. Here at Living Hope, we believe in taking the next steps in our spiritual walk. We want to help you do that. If you are new to our church or you haven't given us any information about you and you're just kind of looking around, we would love to get to know you better. You can scan the welcome code on the back of the seat in front of you, or you can visit the welcome center on your way out. If you've been coming for a while, we would love for you to scan the serve code and a leader will contact you about one of our ministries that you're interested in. To financially support Living Hope, you can either scan the gift code or drop your tithes and offerings in the boxes at the back of the sanctuary after the service. You can also visit our church website. We're really glad that you joined us here at Living Hope. Enjoy the service and have a great week. Well, good morning. morning. Sorry to wake you up. If you have a Bible, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Thanks to Pastor Tim for preaching last week. And I want to remind you of something real quick uh, that we forgot to put in the bulletin, but um, we're going to have a... Uh, a meeting for those who may be interested in heading. We're going to back to Peru in May, and we're going to have an information meeting about that between the after the 1015 service today. And so I encourage you, if you're interested, to come to room 121, which is the old library room, and come and be a, a part of that. And there'll be another one information meeting in January as well uh, to talk about that. They have us going to a, a new area to plant another church. And so we go there, and we, uh, we just share the gospel, and they already have a group of people there. We partner with the people that are there and work, work that area and uh, get together with them. And so look forward to going down that way and, uh, and being a part of what God is doing down there in Lima. So that's after the second service today. Okay? All right, Matthew chapter 6. All right, let me just ask a question real quick here. How many of y'all are in the Christmas spirit? Wow, everybody had to think about that. Now, my wife and I were having this discussion this week about, have you gotten the Christmas spirit yet? And I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, we finally got the trees up last night, so there you go. They're not decorated, but they're up. Amen. Jesus, continuing in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in verse 25 of Matthew chapter 6, he says, Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Is it life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. 
They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what we will wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this time of worship and time in Your Word. Lord, as I pray every week, I pray I decrease and You increase. Speak to our hearts and to our minds, not just for information, but for transformation. Make us more like Jesus for your glory and your kingdom. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I love, I don't know what your Bible has, but my Bible has this as the heading for this section of Scripture. The cure for anxiety. The cure for anxiety. So let me ask you a question to start off our time today. Be honest. Don't be putting the stained glass masquerade on in front of me here. How good are you at worrying? I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, all of us can probably say we have much expertise in the field of worry. Worry and anxiety are a multi-billion dollar industry. I even asked Copilot, which is the AI generator on the Bing browser, I said, how much does it cost for stress and anxiety? Just how much does it cost? It said, that's a hard number to figure out. AI said that. It gave some possible, you know, round numbers, but to get a specific or that kind of thing, it's hard to put a number on it. It is estimated that in America, 61% of people would say they experience high levels of stress and anxiety. Worry and anxiety are paralyzing And they lead to unhealthy lives, both mentally and physically. It leads to depression, anxiety, health issues with your heart, blood pressure, diet, no sleep. Worry and anxiety rob people of joy, peace rest, and many, many, many other things. And the interesting part about all of this is we know all this, yet we do it anyway. See, Jesus is pretty clear in what we're talking about today, and and all of y'all are going to tune this out. I know this. I've preached this text before. People come to me after I preach this passage all the time and say, yeah, but... Yeah, but. It is not to be the way of a follower of Jesus to worry. Yeah. All the moms in here are going nuts right now. (laughs) And they're all coming up with their excuses. And I say that word because that's what Jesus would say. And we're going to talk about why that is as we walk through today. I get it. It's hard. 
I mean, the devil has a stranglehold on us and worry and anxiety and stress, especially here in America. Have you ever thought about what you stress about? Mostly? Really? Just find out what gives you a short fuse real quick. Amen. In the kingdom culture, followers of Jesus put their faith in their heavenly Father as they seek His kingdom as the priority for their lives. Wow, it's quiet in here. This is rubber meeting the road application right here. Look at what he says. He says, therefore. Therefore is there for a reason. It's there for what you talked about the last couple of weeks, where Jesus talks specifically about God and possessions. He says, don't obstore up yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. We talked about that. Pastor Tim came in and talked about the eye being a lamp talked about light and darkness. And in verse 24, it really comes down, no one can serve two masters, whatever that other master is. Since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. How's that working in America? How has it worked in America? I mean, good grief now. I mean, back in the day, back in y'all's day, y'all, when y'all had magazine subscriptions, amen? Y'all had Cosmo and Time and Sports Illustrated and Life, all those things. Ads, they were filled with ads. Remember that? You had a, you had a magazine that was 100 pages, and 75 of them were ads. <laughs> Depending on the magazine, it would maybe have a little page where you could scratch and smell the cologne or the perfume. You had the Marlboro Man taking up both sides, full-page ads. Everybody telling you this is what you need, this is what's important, this is what you got to strive for. These are the things that, that you need to get. And when you didn't get them, what did you do? You stressed and had anxiety. In today's world, in the world of social media, you get ads upon ads upon ads. And it's even worse now because they track what you to click on. They're called algorithms, and they know what you like and don't like. And what do they keep putting into your feed? Things that you like. Amazon knows this. When you go there, they know what to put up in front of your face on your screen. Our jobs, our kids, The bills it causes stress and anxiety. Amen? Amen? So let's talk about the reality here. The reality is this. Jesus commands us not to worry about our lives because they are in the hands of our sovereign, heavenly Father. Did you hear that, Mom? Did you hear that, Dad? Jesus is not saying here that we should have a who cares or a whatever attitude about life at all. Scripture doesn't teach that. He's not telling us to be lazy. Scripture doesn't teach that. And being concerned for certain things is not necessarily a bad thing. It's what you concern yourself with that's our problem. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 28, he's given a, Paul is given, I preached on this last Saturday to a bunch of pastors that were here and and, and he's given a whole litany of defending his apostleship because he had these, these super apostles that were coming to, 
to claim that they knew more than had more, and they were basically Judaizers, telling you got to be a follow Jesus, but do this. Jesus, but instead of Jesus only, it's Jesus plus. And they're questioning his authority. He's not really an apostle. He wasn't there, and all that kind of stuff like that. And giving his story, and then he, and he uses, he talks, he says he's talking like a fool because that's how they would understand. Because those guys talk like fools. But then he comes back to what he does. He gives his uh, justification for his apostleship for the suffering that he endured, and he gives a whole list of things in that passage. But yet he comes to verses twenty-eight and twenty-nine, and he says this: not to mention other things. There is the daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? Paul, this type A, driven, smart, brilliant person, serious about the Great Commission, but also with a pastoral heart, says, I got all these things that are going on in my life. I have all these things that happen to me, and my biggest concern is really for the churches and the people who make up those churches. There are things to be concerned about. We should be concerned about our spiritual journey, our spiritual walk, where we're at. Things that matter to God should be concerning to us. But what Jesus is talking about here is that, that self-centered worry that has its roots in the fact that we just don't trust or have a faith in God. Isn't that what he says? He says, you of little faith, verse 30. The things that we stress about, and I pay we, we all wrestle with this. Nobody is immune from this pandemic that's centuries old. The things that we spend most of our time thinking about, stressing about, are the things that really tell God we don't trust Him to provide for the needs of our life and our kids, and our families. Now, y'all are going to balk at me at that. Don't balk at me. Talk to Jesus about it. Hebrews eleven six. Many of you know this passage already. The writer says, Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, I looked up impossible in the Greek. You know what it means? Impossible. When we start stressing about things that are about us, we're not living by faith. And when we're not living by faith, we are not pleasing our Father. And when we're not trusting in Him, we are not pleasing our Father. And this just isn't in the big stuff. It's in the little things in life, too, because... That's what he tells us to pray for, right? Give us this day our daily bread. So the reality is that we are not to worry about these things. Man, that's hard to do. We need not worry because our Heavenly Father will take care of us. Jesus' point is that since life itself comes from God, life itself comes from God. Amen? Amen. Why should we worry about the things we need in order to live the life that God birthed us to live? It's that simple. God gave you a born date. He gave you a be with him date. You can argue with him about when that be him with him date is. I got no control over it. Right. 
Deuteronomy 32, 39, see now that I alone am he. There is no God but me. I bring death and I give life. I wound and I heal. No one can rescue anyone from my power. Now, we get very uncomfortable about verses like this. See, the sovereignty of God is great until the sovereignty of God isn't so great. Verses like this make it not so great for us. Amen? Hebrews 2.10, For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God for whom and through whom all things exist should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Talking about Jesus there. Pioneer is actually a good word. It's, your, your, tra- your Bible may have author. Pioneer is actually a little bit better translation of what the author is trying to say there. God found it appropriate for his son, the second person of the Trinity, to suffer in order to accomplish what God needed to accomplish through Jesus. Job 14.5, since a person's days are determined and the number of his months depends on you, and since you have set limits, he cannot pass. 1 Samuel 2.6, the Lord brings death and gives life. He sends some down to Sheol and he raises others up. I didn't write that, folks. The point is this, God is God. Our Father is God. He is the one who has put these things in place. God is the one who spoke and the universe situated itself. He is not bound by time. He is not bound by space. He is not bound by our own limitations. He is not bound by anything that we like to try and limit him with. It doesn't mean that we're supposed to be fatalistic and put be stupid on our list of things to do every day. But it does mean that God is in control. Our Father is in charge. And the point is, and Jesus' point is, if our Father is this person, He knows what you need. And He will take care of you to accomplish that which He has appointed for you to accomplish. This takes us all the way to Ephesians 2.10. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do those things which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Now, I don't even try and pretend to understand fully how to wrap my little finite peewee brain around all of that. I just know it's true. And that's just how it is sometimes. We talked about this in our Wednesday night study. We were, t- we're going through the book of Esther on Wednesday nights, and uh, we're just making the point and, uh, about the fact that sometimes God brings us and has us go through things in life that are hard, that are a struggle, that we spend all of our time trying to encourage others going through it, and then all of a sudden we have to go through it. And all of a sudden, things change, right? We're saying to that person who's dealing with something in their life, or maybe in their health, and they say, have faith in God. He will get you through it. And then the doctor comes to you and says, you got this. And you say, oh my gosh, why me? 
I don't deserve this. God, I'm a good kid. Right? right? And God, in the counsels of His divine plan for your life, has brought you to this point to identify with the sufferings of Christ and perhaps to bring glory to Him and advance His kingdom through the trauma that you are facing. And God has every right as the sovereign creator of the universe to do that. It really brings home whether or not we really believe Romans 8, 28. For God works all things for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. We need not worry because our Heavenly Father will take care of us. Now, he's saying this to the disciples, knowing what they're going to go through in advance. He's giving them a heads up now. Don't worry. We need not worry because our Father gives evidence of his sovereign care in his creation. Jesus then gives us three examples to go with. We got the, the birds, we got the wildflowers, and we got the grass, and you kind of connect those two together, but they're there to give us a, a reason to, or an example, an illustration of how the Father in heaven takes care of his very own creation, even after the fall of creation because of what Adam and Eve did in the garden, God is still taking care and doing those things because even the earth, Paul tells us, has birth pains waiting for the day when it is redeemed as well. And just like us, until such time comes, God is still working. Amen. Birds. Our Father provides the means for birds to be fed. They, they seem to have a pretty good knack for taking care of themselves. How do I, we got some ravens around this building. We, we got like four of them. We call them Larry, Moe, and Curly. And then we got one we call Lucifer, because that guy's crazy. They stare at themselves in the mirror glass we have outside, and then they start pecking the window. It's, it's a really a funny thing, quite frankly. <coughs> Yet the birds are able to take care of themselves. God provides for the birds. They have a, a sense to be able to take care of themselves. They know, they seemingly know by instinct what to do in order to survive, whether it's feeding, feeding their young, making a nest. And yet they die. And some birds still do die a terrible death, right? One, of the, one raven got out here. We had a hawk come flying through here a couple weeks ago. And those ravens are pretty good size. That hawk was bigger. Hawk versus raven, I'm taking the hawk. But if God takes care of the birds so that they can be fed, he'll do it for his children. Now, all of you in here, maybe some of you in here are thinking about those very hard places. Even in our own country, there are people who are without, who are hungry. But there are means for them God provides. And if you notice about that, you know what's hard about this passage for us is that we in America, we struggle about these things, what we eat, what we wear. People in, in poor countries tend to not always, but tend to 
be grateful for what they got. They're not wearing designer suits or meeting in a heat-controlled building. They may have to go get water from a well. They may not have a whole lot of protein in their diet or a lot of the other things that we know are good for us that we take for granted because we have access to them, even though we feel like they're ridiculously, stupidly expensive. But they seem grateful and thankful to God for those things. Wildflowers. Jesus compares the wildflowers to the, to the regalia that Solomon, and Solomon couldn't touch the beauty of the wildflowers. Now, many of you guys like to go at that time of year, early spring, and go driving around and going up in those places and see the wildflowers across the fields and do all that stuff, and you be you. Enjoy nature. But it's cool, right? You go down to Carlsbad at a certain time of year and you see all them tulips lined up and all those things and their rows and all that kind of stuff like that. And it says God takes care of wildflowers. How about the grass of the field? If God takes care of grass, grass, Hey, straw, insignificant little pieces of grass. How much not more will he not take care of you and me, his child? And I put this in all caps, mostly for the next service, because then here probably don't have to worry about it so much. But we, as human beings, are more important to God than birds, wildflowers, and grass because we're made in His image. Amen. Amen. Yes. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in His own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Amen. If you're a child of God, He loves you. He'll take care of you. Now, if you want to argue with God about how He's taking care of you, like your kids talk about how, complain to you about how you took care of them, or you know, you know what I'm talking about, amen. amen. That's a conversation between you and God. But it doesn't take from the truth that God has taken care and provided for you. Amen. And, and I, I get it because we struggle with this. I mean, if you, if you, I was so thinking about this yesterday as, as I heard the report, and we sit here today, and it just, it, it can really just eat at your inside if you let it. Where, you know, the Dodgers have signed Shohei Otani, if y'all don't know that. If you don't care, you're good. It is not going to change your life to know that the Dodgers signed Shohei Otani for a 10-year contract for $700 million. Stupid. And you sit there and you hear that. And you're like, God! What's up? <laughs> right? Then you have to check yourself and repent because what you're saying, whether you mean to or not, is that you don't think God is taking care of you. I'm with you, man. Woman, child, boy, girl. I was, we were coming in this morning. I was hearing it. He makes like 
$220 a second. God is in control. And while I don't know Shohei Otani's heart, we do know this. The Bible's pretty clear that even those who don't believe will prosper in this fallen world that we live in. So we just need to get over it. But do think about it. <laughs> So Jesus says this. He says, we don't have to worry because we are our Father's ch children. He's sovereign. We are His child, so He'll take care of us. And He gives us a couple of questions through this passage that are, that are really, really get to the core. The first one is, is, is there more to life than food and clothing? We would all say, hopefully, yes. Some of you in here, in your snarky Baptist mood, are saying it's, it's yes until you don't have those things. I get it. So does God. So does God. And then he says this. And this is the one that moms want to just go crazy about. What is the value of worrying? Those are the two questions. So is there more to life than food and clothing? And the answers are resounding, yes. There is God's plan and there is God's purpose for our lives. We are all to glorify God and advance His kingdom in all that we do. The sphere and context with which you do that is what's specific to your sphere and context. Just like our church, Living Hope Church, we are in Hesperia, California, the high desert of Southern California, in the year 2023, to do our part to glorify God and advance His kingdom and all that encompasses in 2023, 2024, and going forward. And you're a part of this church family. If you're arguing about when you were going to die or when you were born, you're still here. And as long as you're still here, you still have a plan and a purpose that is more important than those other other things that we spend all of our time thinking about. God knows that if we're distracted by what we perceive as needs, we will not prioritize His plan and purpose for our lives. And we fall for this every time. This Desert. How many of you have lived in the desert more than 10 years? Raise your hand. Keep putting them up high. You're going to keep them up for a second because I think this is a cool experiment. 20 years. 30 years. 40 years. 50 years. 60 years. 70 years. Is your arm stuck, Bob? <laughs> 75. 80. <laughs> you ain't that old. <laughs> but if you've lived up here for any length of time, the economy up here has been historically a blue-collar service-based economy that has lived on the ebbs and flows of the building and contracting industry in SoCal. I know this because many of you know my father-in-law, who's with Jesus now, and his dad, they had a lumber yard here in the desert, here at Hesperia for years until Home Depot came along and put the picture of the lumber yard up in their break room and said, they'll be gone, they'll be gone, they'll be gone. And guess what? They're all gone. That was the mid 90s You all remember that time. Some of you in here have had your house for that long. 
and you've seen the value of your home go... Right? All based on those ebbs and flows. It makes us nervous. It distracts us. And because we've been based on that type of industry, we're not that way anymore. Actually, we're a more blue-collar town than we are, or more, more white-collar town than blue-collar town now. You say, really? I'm like, yeah. Do you know who the largest employers are in the high desert? It's the school districts. You know who the largest employer in the high desert is? It's the Hesperia Unified School District. They're made up of teachers and administrators. They ain't blue collar. It's changed. But I've met contractor after contractor, and when the times are bad, they work seven days a week to try and get business. And then when bad times are really good, they work seven days a week because they got to keep working while business is good. And then I come back to them and say, hey, brother, hey, sister, hey, you're working good. It's great. You're working, trying to get business. That's good. It's great. But where's God in the middle of all of that? Well, God's just going to have to wait. I've heard it over and over and over again. So God knows these things. He knows we're going to get distracted if, by, if we don't have these things that provided for us, are the needs that we have. So he provides for that so that we don't have to worry about them. So what is the value in worrying? There is no value in worrying. He goes on and he says, what are you worrying about? He says, worried like three times. What's the value in worrying? There isn't any. It doesn't add a day to your life. It decreases your time, right? quite frankly, medically speaking. God hauls all that worked out, but your quality of your life can certainly be while you're on this planet, if you're going to be a warrior ward, you are not living out God's fullest potential for your life, period. You're not. I'm not. We're not to worry as our Father's children, but rather seek our Father's kingdom. Y'all have to listen really fast. Jesus gives a command to seek his kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first in our lives God's kingdom, and everything else will fall into place by his sovereign hand. We live life in the world when we do not put God first. He says, look, if you're going to live this way and worry about all these things, you're no different than the Gentiles. You're no different than a non-believer. And a lot of Christians now are living a lot more like non-believers than they are followers of Jesus, trusting in themselves and not in their Father in heaven to provide for the needs that they have. It's inevitable. Our flesh when consumed with fleshly things and with the enemy in our ear telling us this is what we got to do, this is what we got to do. If you don't do this, you're going to have pressure, you're going to have stress, you're going to have anxiety. Those things are okay because you're striving to get the things that will make you feel good and happy. Have you met anybody who's striving for all these things with dealing with stress who's good and happy? Smoking three packs a day. I mean, I see these stories and high blood pressure and taking all kinds of pills just to get through the day. But they got a thriving business, but they have a lousy life. And that's not what God wants for us. The formula to stop worrying is to stop worrying and start seeking. Stop worrying about your little kingdoms and start seeking God's big kingdom. Be active and not passive about seeking God's kingdom, doing those things that matter to God. 
Go for God's plan and purpose and watch God take care of you. Live today for Him and watch worry disappear. There's a hymn that you guys sing, and we, we, you guys know it. I should have put all of it in here, but I ran out of space. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He's on His throne. Have faith in God. He watches or His own. He cannot fail. He will prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Our Father, who took care of our biggest need on the cross of Calvary, can certainly be trusted to take care of everything else. He secured our eternity, and He will see us through today. Amen. In the kingdom culture, followers of Jesus put their faith in their heavenly Father as they seek His kingdom as the priority for their lives. Amen? Amen. Father God, we thank you for this time in your word. We pray, we confess, we worry too much. And for that, we confess our sin. We repent. May we seek you and your kingdom first. And let you take care of the rest. We thank you for how you've blessed us, blessed us and provided for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. I pray you have a blessed week. We'll see you next week here at Living Hope Church. Have a great week, everybody.